Hi, I'm Tiffany. And I'm Rihanna, and welcome or welcome back to Fresh Off the Broke. Fresh Off the Broke is about personal experiences growing up Asian American in a predominantly white community, Asian media, and Asian pop culture in general. Race has always been a sensitive topic. Every day, there are debates over race. With the podcast, we intend to shed light on the experiences of first generation Asian immigrants, not with a lot of pedestals. We understand that race isn't everything, but there should be an acknowledgement of people of color, the knowledge gap, and the racial divide that will ideally be broken. Now that that's out of the way, let's get into the episode. Today's topic is the toxic Asian entertainment business. Now, just a quick disclaimer before we get started. We will mostly be talking about the East Asian entertainment industry, specifically Japan and Korea. And a couple trigger warnings, we will be mentioning suicide in this episode. So please stay cautious. Yes, uh, listen or and or view at your own discretion. Yes. The reason why we're talking about this is because, <laughs> kind of weird, but recently I went on a google deep dive on johnny and associates which is an entertain entertainment company that we will be getting into later in the episode um and i found some crazy crazy things and it just blew my mind and tiffany and i both um not, not like our hardcore k-pop fans um but we do listen to k-pop we do consume some of that media and we I think we're both not as into it as we were before, but we definitely were into it before, and we do have a pretty good understanding of the toxic side of that, so we just wanted to talk about that today. Uh, one other thing, when we're when we're going to be talking about the like toxic part of East Asian entertainment, we're going to be looking at this from both sides of the coin, so we're going to also be talking about the company, like toxic business practices or like very unhealthy management mm -hmm. and also like the consumer side. So whether that be like obsessive fans or like taking advantage and like exploiting fans, like stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Everything is toxic, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, business is... It's, I mean, people always say that you can't if you can't really become a millionaire, especially not a billionaire, without having exploited some people mm -hmm. just because of the nature of business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's definitely the case for today's topic. Mm -hmm. So I guess hopping right into it, We'll talk about K-pop first. So I think that a pretty big aspect to K-pop that I think, honestly, was popularized or made known to like Western fans and media by Shane Dawson, um, which Shane no Dawson. shout out to that man at all. Um, but he did a video... Um, he has like a conspiracy theory series and did I say that right conspiracy theory series that's a weird thing to say sorry distracted um, <laughs> <laughs> so back before like all of the controversy with him he had a conspiracy theory like series where he would talk about different conspiracy theories obviously and one of, the things he, <laughs> one of the things he mentioned were k-pop slave contracts because this was the time where bts was like just starting to get super popular in the west um so some of you may already know what slave contracts are but if you don't know slave contracts is a term associated with the contract uh an aspiring k-pop singer signs when joining a company the slave contract is defined as a contract listed with terms and conditions that the artist deemed not fair or unjust. So this contract works by starting a debt with when the artist signs it and it grows on time by time. And this debt includes all the expenses paid by the company. So rent, food, electricity, haircuts, clothing, anything, and all staff payments. So this means that trainees, so people who aren't even idols yet, their debts are huge. And when they become an idol, 
all that money goes back to their company and towards paying this debt. So Mm -hmm. on top of that, companies do not need to be transparent about this debt. This is known as BEP or break even point, meaning that most artists have no way of knowing how much they have paid off or how much they're making. And as the trainees of groups progress with each new album and promotion period, the costs are re-added to the BEP, meaning that the debt debt is constantly growing and it can take years for groups to make the break even point, if they even do. Yeah, and then when you try and leave a group and many have, uh, then there's, there's a lot of like legal obstacles and financial obstacles too. Like I'm thinking back to... Mm-hmm. I'm thinking back to like when Chinese members of EXO were leaving EXO, mm-hmm. which if you know, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know why Tiffany paused when she said that. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, you know. Yeah. And even it's like... A, it's a doozy to leave. Yeah. It's, it's a lot. And even whole groups together decide to leave. And even though you would think that, you know, like more people standing up together maybe it would be a lot easier or not as difficult for the court to decide something no it's still incredibly difficult and like people have seen or personally I've witnessed like groups just completely disappear when they try to make that decision and leave their slave contracts Mm -hmm. and when they leave they just they're gone they have no way of it's like they're blacklisted somehow. It's insane. Yeah, I know. And I think that's such a main... It's such a characteristic point of, like, especially the Asian entertainment business that idols are mass-produced. Oh, yeah, for sure. Especially as the years go by. Mm-hmm. And we'll get into how that started in the first place. But um, I was talking to like one of my old teachers about K-pop, weirdly. And she was just <laughs> like, she does not like, she's not into K-pop or anything, but she like would watch documentaries on K-pop. And it just, it was so fascinating to oh, her goodness. that they're just pumping out idols, like, like a production line and like, I never really thought about it that way because I just grew up like consuming that media and being like, you know, this is normal, but (laughs) it is insane. Like it's insane to think about. Yeah. Like you can, you can literally be a trainee for your entire life and never debut ever. Yeah, exactly. And that's your life. You're working towards a goal that'll never be met. Like for example, Obviously, we don't really know trainees who are training and are just going to be stuck in the training period for the rest of their life because we're just never, we'll never know about them. But Johnny from NCT, he was training for what, 10 years before they decided to debut him? 10 years of his yeah. life. They said I, he, he could have debuted in X, though. Yeah. And take in that, like, when he started training, 10 years was probably like, a good chunk of his life he's probably uh, I don't know maybe 15 14 when he started and he spent 10 years as a trainee that is terrifying that's a lot of your time I mean that's uh, your life 10 years you could become a doctor you could you could fully have a like go through a whole education process and be making money But instead, he grew up in the basement of SM, and (laughs) I'm glad, not funny at all, but it's especially, like, sad, because I remember, because I I bring up Johnny, because he holds a very dear part of my heart, but (laughs) there's this, (laughs) there's a video of him as a trainee, so I think, um, there were there's younger boys in NCT that had already debuted at that point um mm-hmm. so like mark <laughs> mark 
also had been training for a while but he's significantly younger than Johnny and he like became an idol a lot faster um anyways there's a video of Johnny as a trainee that they released for his birthday and it's him like the trainees like surprising him and then a video like from his mom basically saying like you know we love you so much you're working so hard and he's just crying and just to think about like this kid had been like training for probably like eight years at that point when this video came out and he like he's essentially like an adult and his mom is sending him videos being like stay strong and all he can do is watch and cry because he's under this contract and he's hooked in like he's you've dedicated your life to this at this point like you can't really yeah. leave you can it just be really difficult but uh, yeah it's so awful to to think about mm-hmm. and i'm sorry i'm like going off <laughs> um I mean go ahead <laughs> it really annoys me at the intersection between k-pop and the west because people don't really understand the underlying mechanisms of the k-pop industry um so people will just like say really insensitive things or they'll complain about certain things and it's just really tone deaf to these people who are again like being mass produced and treated like they're called slave contracts like <laughs> that's not a joke they're referred to at they're referred to as slave contracts um mm-hmm. and it's not so, normal either yeah it's not and so when like western fans like they'll be seeing videos of their idols and be like oh, why don't they come here one complaint or another is like, why do they look so tired all the time they're not giving their energy blah 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 like complaining and it's like you don't understand what these people are going through <laughs> mm-hmm. which ugh, we'll get into it but that's just the tip of the iceberg for me yeah as Rihanna was saying, there's a lot of stress that comes with even just, well, for one, the process of even trying to become a K-pop idol. But once you are one, it's still an extremely stressful process because, I mean, the entertainment business universally is extremely harsh and judgmental. And then it's inevitable that you get hate comments or and things like that mm-hmm. but I mean not that they're warranted but mm-hmm. there's a lot of stress that comes with being a k-pop idol outside of maintaining I guess your singing or dancing ability because your every movement is criticized and especially I mean the thing is like people online are universally pretty cruel Mm -hmm. but netizens which basically means people online Uh it's a word that people use a lot uh, when when talking about people online in asia i'm not Mm -hmm. really sure why because i'll hear people say like chinese netizens and like wherever netizens but we never really say that here no we don't at all fun fact (laughs) Netizens, especially in East Asia, are particularly just cruel. Mm -hmm. And it drives these celebrities who are, at the end of the day, people with feelings. They they drive them to, like, very, very extreme points. And it it will, it it takes a big toll on them, especially, for instance, uh, Sully, a former member of FX, mm-hmm. she a few years ago, uh, because of like this, the relentless, and I mean, not that it would, it would or it should make sense, but people always were so mean to her for no reason. Not that they yeah. should have a reason, but they were just always so mean to her, mm-hmm. and they would make fun of her or insult her everywhere all the time. Mm-hmm. And because of the the stress and the impact it had on her mental health, she ultimately took her life. Mm-hmm. And I mean, 
if you go on her Instagram, you'll notice that, or even if you just look up like slowly cyberbullying or slowly hate comments, slowly bullying, people mm-hmm. were so cruel to her. Mm-hmm. Just all the time. I mean, it was it was just so I It just a a big question mark in my head. Yeah. How people can do that to someone. Like what did she ever do? Mm-hmm. Not that I'm saying and anyways. No, it, yeah. it was yeah. just it's Insane. just really unfortunate. I mean, like the fact that that drove her to take her own life. Mm-hmm. And it's really annoying as well because people will I often hear the argument of you're an idol you should be like you should know that this could have happened like and you should be prepared to deal with it and also like people will argue it it was online like it's not that bad it wasn't real life but when you're an idol you essentially are what you are online like that is you because you are an idol like that is how people consume media about you that's how you are publicized everywhere that's your life that's your job and so yeah and social media has become a part of your career yeah and like if all you're seeing about your own self is just hate and people saying like people were sending like you know like kill yourself type things type notes if that's all you see like that really takes a toll on somebody. Mm-hmm. And it's the thing is... So unfortunate. Like I was yes. saying, social media is a big part of their career, which is mm-hmm. different than if you're a Hollywood actor, especially a more, like a seasoned one, because a, a lot of them, they don't have instagram and if they do it's not there it's like someone posts on their behalf mm-hmm. and so they don't really have to keep up on social media or even like post anything on social media there are plenty of extremely famous i mean i don't think robert pattinson has instagram that's a ra- very random <laughs> but i guess topical <laughs> reference <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Love he that. doesn't. He doesn't have Instagram. I mean, and people are okay with it, or it's just not. It wouldn't be as big of a deal because K-pop idols they're they're expected to be active on social media. I mean, I mm-hmm. there's a app that's come out in the past few years that idols are on now. I think it's called Bubble, mm. where you can text your you can text celebrities mm. and they respond to you it's like mm. a a chat service except mm-hmm. rather than like not like instagram it's more i guess it's kind of like a fan cafe except it's yeah a fan cafe in the sense that all the celebrities are on there and you mm. add i mean I don't, I don't have it so mm. i don't know if, if you add people or if you search for them I, I i don't know how it works mm. but that's that's a new app that they have because i mean before there i mean it still exists probably but before there was like there was be live right mm-hmm. where it was live streaming and then you can talk to people or you can get access to behind the scenes videos you have to pay but mm-hmm. with bubble oh, man. i i don't know if you have to pay with bu- with bubble i can <sighs> double check but Celebrities have to be a lot more accessible now. Yeah. And I think that's a really big difference as well between Western and like, well, in this case, specifically Korea, Korean media is that social media and literally like dedicating idols, parts of idols days to just social media work is such a big thing. And here we have more like social media influencers. That would be their thing. But it's like if, uh hmm. I'm trying to think of okay you subscribe person. and yes you do have to pay okay that's good 
I mean, it's not good, but I think it's better than having a completely free and accessible four dollars per thing. star per month i don't know if that's four dollars u.s it because it says dollars so i'm assuming it's not in korean mm-hmm. uh, currency like one four dollars yeah. per star or i guess group a month yeah the concept of social media in the k-pop industry is just it blows my mind and also again I took it for not took it for granted but it was so normalized to me like because when we me and Tiffany were more into k-pop it was more on like v live v live was like the main thing um and again like I I thought it was pretty normal um for idols to have like a live streaming service uh like you could pay to talk to them or pay to get more frequent up like things like that and we actually did a project on it on V Live, and oh, the yeah. responses with media media uh, analysis. Yeah, um, the responses I to this really project. I didn't know it existed before I met you. Really? Not that you introduced me to it, but I didn't really know. Yeah, because I didn't have it. I didn't really know anything about it. Uh, until I mean, okay, I guess that's not true because I knew someone that had it, or I knew two people that had it but mm-hmm. I didn't well, know anything about it because I didn't get it I like, not that... didn't get it like I didn't understand it but I didn't have it and then yeah yeah when we decided to make a project about it I learned more about it through the project mm-hmm. I also anyway like I think that's because a uh, part of that was also because VLive was just starting to get like to its peak at that point I also didn't understand like the complete mechanism to it because I wasn't paying for like extra things Um, I was just using it Mm -hmm. to watch lives but when we did this project in my head it was very I don't know about you but in my head it was very like this is it like I'm just we're just laying out the facts and I'm not like I don't have any strong emotions towards it I'm just like this is how I watch idols this is what this is a thing but I remember our teacher for that class was like appalled (laughs) he loved in mind he was going insane at the concept of V-Live. And I remember being like, it's not that big of a deal. Like, it's just a thing. But, like, looking back, and, like, now that I'm not, like, emotionally so attached funny. to it, like, that is insane. <laughs> All of this is pretty insane. And little I spoiler, really, yeah. I think that, j- like, J-pop industry version of this is ten times worse. But we'll get into that again. <laughs> uh-huh. I, uh... I mean, I played it up a little bit for our presentation, but I was very shocked or I, to use to, I guess, use the terms we're talking about with her teacher, I lost my mind a little bit in terms of the money aspect of v mm-hmm. because I was doing the math and I was thinking like, uh, V-Live currency, I can't remember what it's called, but like the, there's the V-Live currency, like when you're buying it, and then mm-hmm. how much it would cost to mm-hmm. subscribe to yeah. a group. And then I was I was doing the math for, okay, what if you, it's a group that only streams once a month? Mm-hmm. And then, but your subscription is still there. And then there was the concept of behind the scenes like extra oh, videos yeah. the, the extra private live oh my that god that i lost yeah. my mind over jesus i mean it's almost like impressive at how much this industry has capitalized off of essentially teenage girls <laughs> um like these are platforms that work and they work well and they rake yeah. in so much money. And it's, that's not even like source of like a main source of income for idols or for like staff involved. Like this is just one piece of the puzzle to the industry as a whole. And that's insane. Mm-hmm. All this talk about 
be live and watching your idols every move essentially brings us into the fan aspect of the industry specifically obsessive fans and this plays into parasocial relationships which exist everywhere and if you don't know what a parasocial relationship is perilous social relationships occur when you experience a one-sided emotional attachment with a fictional character or media personality and just a little history behind that the concept was first introduced by researchers donald horton and r richard wool in the 1950s so for example let's say you really really love jimin from bts <laughs> <laughs> To the point where you you believe like you know him personally. That is a pretty obsessive parasocial relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, again, it's a one-sided emotional attachment. I hate to break it to everybody, but at the end of the day, these idols do not know you. That man doesn't know you. No, not at all. They know you as a small piece of a giant term they consider fans that's yeah it. or like they know you as a part of your their check yeah that's it and as much as that sucks to hear it's the truth <laughs> and people take this very seriously for example well i think ollie london is a pretty bad example because they're an internet troll but Ollie London had this obsession with, I think, Jimin, actually. Um, to the point where Ollie London was saying, like, I'm getting married to Jimin and was posting about it. And people were like, what is wrong with you? Um, but that's an example of an obsessive fan. I actually have a example as well. Oh, that's let's a hear. More personal. Imagine you're like, oh, I, I, I know a girl named Rihanna and... <laughs> Yes. she was like obsessed with Park Jihoon and still is <laughs> no that, I wasn't gonna say that but oh you, perfect now that you, you just put that out there <laughs> it's okay that was like I'm, such I'm... a that was such a self report <laughs> it was it's okay though <laughs> anyways continue <laughs> What the heck? Sorry, I saw a video of him earlier today and I've been thinking about him. Guys, I swear, <laughs> I'm not, I understand that he doesn't know who I am. I just like him. That's it. Anyways. <laughs> I think you're going to need to give me a second to just <laughs> get over that moment <laughs> and move on. Mm -hmm. So what I was going to say <laughs> was, I don't know if you remember, because I don't think you knew her that well, or if you didn't really have classes with her, but there was this girl named Rihanna. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> there was this girl whose name will not be called. Yes. I went to high school with, that was obsessed with BTS. And hmm. he had a really strong, like, emotional attachment to them hmm. to the point where she would get extremely sad or she'd be really down sometimes. And it would be because she was upset or she was just really, really sad that they will never know how much she loves them or like how Damn. thankful she is for them and this That's is like crazy and this is not me assuming she said this to me because i was asking <laughs> her if she was okay or she was just really she was just really down it mm -hmm. happened on more than one occasion mm. but she would be really down and it would be because she wished that they could know mm. how much they mean to her and here's the thing i mean when you have people that you look up to whether or not they're celebrities i understand the feeling of like wishing you could thank them like thank you you 
changed my life for the better or thank you, you helped me get through something. Mm-hmm. But this was on like another level. Yeah. She would be like down, down. I mean, I said that five times, but she would just be like really Gone. down. Yeah. Really sad. And I don't mean sad like upset and crying kind of sad. I mean sad like sit in the corner kind of that t- that time of sad like the, mm. the silent I'm and upset. it was it was really concerning because yeah and she would and this was not a one time occurrence it happened on more than one occasion and then she would also post about it sometimes and i think that is an excellent example of parasocial a a parasocial relationship Mm, yeah that's i mean it's such a toxic thing um yeah because like yes people are like obsessive and like that's insane to think that someone could feel so strongly about people that they're never ever gonna meet personally ever but at the same time like you have to take in that most fans are you know teenage girls and like teenagers <laughs> period that's they're all we need really to say hard. yeah exactly <laughs> they're, like, they're going through hard. a rough time um so like having that relationship in or having that in their life is very important uh, especially just for like development in general but it like it can take a can turn for the worse sh- yeah it can also stunt in hard oh yeah for sure um it's you have to find that balance and mm-hmm. i think especially with k-pop lots of people don't find that balance <laughs> <laughs> i know a girl <laughs> i want to stop doing that okay wait i need to give a disclaimer hey you started this i know i did but it's so because... funny because you're like not as into it as before and then here you are saying <laughs> okay listen anyway, i bring it up because haha funny but i ultimately like i never ever ever want to meet my idols in real life ever i don't i don't it's not that i idolize them it's just i like them as idols but just using the term idol um I never want to meet them because that will break my like I'm perfectly fine with my like seeing them online and that's it like I don't want to see them in real life oh, like the that'll... pedestal <laughs> yeah I need them to stay on that pedestal because when I see that they're a real person like I'm not I'm not gonna not fun anymore <laughs> <laughs> these obsessive parasocial relationships are essentially the root and the start of another very characteristic thing of the k-pop industry which are stalking fans or fans that stalk their idols slash they're called sasang fans or saysang fans i'm not sure if i'm saying that right but i think i think wait is that sasang is it spelled correctly here i don't know let me check (laughs) And no, no, you you spelled it correctly, I think. Okay. Yeah, yeah. S A S A E N G. So that would be that would be Sasang. Yeah. Yes, Sasang. Okay. Hopefully, we're saying all right. But um, not to say that crazy obsessive stalkers don't exist in the West, but there's like a term for it in the K-pop industry, Sasang fans. Um, and these are fans that go to the extreme to either contact their idol, have like talk to their idol, or to literally try and hurt their idol. Um, mm-hmm, just for their attention. Yeah. So one main example that I'm thinking of is, um, I think EXO, they had landed in an airport somewhere. Maybe it wasn't an airport, but EXO was in a building. And they were in the bathroom and multiple Sasang fans had shaved their head just so they could pass as boys to get into the bathroom and talk to the EXO members. 
That's insane. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, and there are pictures too. Like there are Oh, did they get arrested? I think so, something like that. Or because they were minors, so like kind of difficult, but that's one example. Um I remember well, I also <laughs> Um, a member of 101 had a sasang fan who kept going to his house and just taking pictures. Um, mm-hmm. But that, honestly, like, that's a pretty mild case of a sasang fan. Like, these are people who, like, some of them attempt murder. Um, yeah, and some of them, I mean, I guess murder is the most extreme, but a yeah. lot of them, they will purposely work at phone companies or travel agencies so that they can get access mm-hmm. to celebrity information, like get access mm-hmm. to their phone numbers. Mm-hmm. Because if you work at a telephone company, especially, I guess, a major carrier, I don't know, maybe somehow you will... I mean, it, it, just because you work there doesn't mean that you're going to get the information, but they find their ways. Yeah, of course. Um... And then there's the whole taxi thing. Yeah. Like, oh, no. Taxi. There are drivers who capitalize off of these fans because they their service is that they will drive you so that you can, like, follow them around. Mm-hmm. I remember there was this one incident with, I mean, Luha's not in K-pop anymore, but, and also this happened in China, but a few years ago, uh, there was incident where uh Luhan was caught on video yelling at this driver that was capitalizing off of obsessive fan mm-hmm. and like driving his fans around following him when he was filming filming a tv show yeah a drama and it it was it was really crazy I mean not like the way not the way Luhan was behaving because I mean uh rightfully so he should be upset mm-hmm. it's it's crazy that there are people that capitalize off of it's like a taxi service except not a taxi service that yeah brings you to a destination well, I, mean, I guess it, it is a destination but it like brings you to your your idol mm-hmm. i've heard um similar versions to that where fans will um, rent out vans that look like the vans that pick up the idols and like drive them from venue oh to venue. God. Yeah, so they'll literally park like right beside the actual van in hopes that the idols will get confused, open the wrong one, and get in. Oh uh, my god! Yeah. What? Yeah. Um. Also, I actually hadn't also hadn't heard of that one. <laughs> um. Another trigger warning: mentions of self harm. Uh, they're like I've personally seen this. Um, fans will often cut their idols' names into their arms. However, I do think that this is more of a Western thing. Um, that Western fans do because um, one there used to be trends like cut for Justin Bieber or cut for One Direction when One Direction was dis- uh, breaking up. Um, but little personal story, there was this like app, a K-pop app that people use. It was essentially just like Instagram, but just for K-pop boy groups. Um, and like, there was no like moderation or anything. It was like an amino app type thing. Um, and it was mainly people, (laughs) um, not Korean fans using it. It was like people from the West slash people from like Southeast Asia, uh and one one instance happened where a sasang fan um kept posting pictures of her cutting an exo num- member's name into her arm and she was just posting it and because i had an account oh, wow this is going to sound awful i was a child okay i had a, an account like <laughs> yeah. like a fan account to the guy that she was cutting for so she would like comment under my pictures and stuff and message me and be like he's mine back off look at me like I'm dedicated like 
and oh you interacted with her yeah like she was like seeking out my posts and being like change your username um like insane like insanity and she was just posting pictures of her arm with his full name on her arm and like because it was just like a fan made app like the moderation was so bad that this was her posts were getting so much traction because everyone's like what's going on this is awful so they were just bumping it up to the top of the page and like yeah bad very bad (laughs) what what app was this um I think it was literally called like it, it's not on the app store at all anymore I've been looking for it because I wanted to see my old account but it was called like k-pop boy group photo ping or something like that um oh I also never heard of it yeah it was just one of those like I don't know how I found it I think I must have searched up k-pop on the app store and just downloaded it but yeah it was that was a time and that was like a western fan who did that mm-hmm. but yeah saucing fans crazy <laughs> i mean not funny <laughs> not funny yeah but also yeah we are we are laughing at a shot i mean we don't have to defend I mean, you guys get it y'all get it mm-hmm. oh and then kind of going back to what we're saying with Zoe Mm -hmm. and judgment a lot I know they have to apologize a lot Mm -hmm. sometimes it could just be for I don't know not looking as presentable or yeah or like not dancing petty petty things yeah Yeah, petty petty things online uh I don't know if I've seen someone. I mean, maybe they have. It's, I don't know if I've seen someone apologize for the reason you just said. But anyway, there have been a lot of instances where idols will have to apologize because they did or said something that strongly offended people, like from a, from a political aspect. And mm-hmm, this happens mm-hmm. a lot with international k-pop idols that come to or go to korea to be a k-pop idol like chinese k-pop stars or japanese k-pop stars i mean k-pop like native like native korean k-pop stars also have to apologize a lot and a lot of the times it could be like sometimes someone will get in trouble for saying that they're proud of their like Chinese heritage mm-hmm. because then some fan or just some people will take it as them saying that Korea isn't as good and then they have to apologize mm-hmm. because well I, I guess like the difference between K-pop and maybe Western entertainment business is that your company will control you on either side, but there's a little bit more freedom of speech mm-hmm. uh, for the Western side of things. A lot of the time in like Asian entertainment business, they can force you to apologize. And so mm-hmm. you'll see a lot of, it's pretty characteristic of K-pop, idols like their apologies they have to write a whole handwritten letter and sign it Mm -hmm. and things like that it's also really upsetting to see because a lot of the time it's just like very innocent things done by like minors or essentially children so like the main example i'm thinking of is sue you from twice right yeah yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh god um when she was 16 she had to apologize um well she was i guess forced to apologize for holding the taiwanese flag during an appearance on a tv show um she was 16 when this happened and i think the context was they were all like they were all given flags or 
yeah they were provided with flags of their like country of heritage just for like a little segment on the tv show and she was given the taiwanese flag um and she had to apologize afterwards for waving it around it's it's not a (laughs) one-time occurrence i mean her alone she's had to apologize a lot Mm -hmm. stuff like this and then Mm -hmm. like i was saying sometimes Sometimes you're just in the uh, wrong place at the wrong time, or mm-hmm. and then you you get ma- a massive amount of hate. Like many, not many years ago. I mean, I guess maybe many years ago. Years ago, Tiffany, not me, <laughs> <laughs> from Girls Generation, a veteran K-pop group. She had to apologize sim- simply just for posting a story like an, an instagram story from because they were in japan but it was korea's like korea day like national independence day or something along the lines of that and mm-hmm. she had just made a in, innocent instagram story live from japan kind of saying stuff like hey like so happy we're in japan like hi guys like hi J- japanese fan just because they're in japan they're gonna have a concert mm-hmm. it it's pretty normal but because it was a wrong time wrong place like bad timing thing people Mm -hmm. exploded at her yeah because they took it as her like how dare she celebrate and because okay i mean there's like historical context because like japanese imperialism but Mm -hmm. if if we take a step back from that she was promoting as a like as a celebrity you naturally promote that you're doing yeah. a concert somewhere. Yeah, like you're in the country. Mm-hmm. It, she was never, she never said anything that was going to allude to the fact that it was better. Or yeah. Worse. It was just a wholesome, hey, we're in Japan. Love y'all. Yeah. It was never that, it was never that serious. No. <laughs> Ugh. Again, very innocent reasons, and but because they are idols, they're forced to apologize, and mm-hmm. netizens blow things out of proportion. As always. Mm-hmm. And then one last thing that falls under this obsessive fan and strict monitoring umbrella is dating. Mm-hmm. Dating is taken extremely seriously and negatively in the K-pop industry. Mm-hmm. And, I and think the K-pop K-pop industry. industry. Because, yes. <laughs> and I think K-pop or like entertainment, well, not entertainment. Yeah. So I think K-pop industry, parentheses K-pop industry, if you understand, mm-hmm. because it doesn't seem like actors get as much slack or that's the word slack yeah yeah for dating as k-pop idols do because for one you're basically not allowed to date or else your career is over Mm -hmm. and it really sucks because the whole reasoning behind that is if you are dating someone then it ruins the fantasy that you're someone else that you're a fan's boyfriend or your uh-huh. fan's significant other you break that parasocial relationship mm-hmm. and you, we want to capitalize on that parasocial relationship <laughs> yeah and Ugh. it really sucks because so a lot of couples they get forcefully broken up because they are dating and they're entertainment company or respective company make them release a statement i mean here's the thing maybe they're still dating i like here in my heart i like to think they're still dating because i think mm-hmm. it's unfortunate yeah but they have to forcefully break up so mm-hmm. i i choose to believe that they're still dating mm-hmm. but it's really awful because there's also a lot of hate and I mean, like I, like I've been saying, it's pretty universal in the entertainment industry. Yeah, hey, but those say things to like taking sides. Oh, like, she's not good enough for him. Like, mm-hmm. I hate you for taking him away from me. Mm-hmm. 
things like that. He's mine. Yeah, or not hers. Yeah. Ugh. Just let, let them be happy. For real. Yeah, and the thing is, I noticed that it's not as big of a deal in the Chinese entertainment industry. Hmm. I mean, celebrities will still make jokes. Actors and singers alike, or like performers alike, they have they will make jokes saying, "Oh, I can't date." Then I then I'll be out of a job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's not as serious over there as it is in the K-pop industry. Yeah, people don't seem to care as much, it, unless you're super famous or you're a particularly. You're a, a celebrity that happens to have a lot of parasocial fans. It's not mm -hmm. really a big deal at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember there was a girl that when Luhan revealed or announced or confessed, I don't know what the word would be, but when he said that he had a girlfriend, he was dating this actress. I mean, he still is dating this actress. Mm hmm uh a girl like one of his fans threatened to jump off a building jeez if he didn't break up with her typical yeah and that was stopped she <laughs> did not jump off the building she That's was going good. to like that was it was a serious thing but that has been resolved mm. and they are still together they've been together for a while very happy for them good yes Oh man. Yeah. Dating in K pop and J pop industry, like you can't even joke about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. No jokes allowed. Um and this kind of like leads us into um our I guess analysis on the J pop industry. Or more of just, it's not an analysis. This is more just me talking about Johnny and Associates and different examples. Um, and wanting to hear Johnny, reaction. I'm thinking of like your earlier tangent on Johnny. <laughs> yeah, kind of kind of confusing with that. But um, this reminds me of, there was a, a idol in a J-pop group called AKB48, um, which essentially think like, if you're familiar with Produce 101, it's essentially that but Japanese um so think like massive girl group 48 members um I think might be more than that but there was a girl in this group who of course like they're not allowed to date um because their whole like the way that you capitalize off of these young girls is to make them seem available and build that parasocial relationship um but people found out <laughs> that she had a boyfriend and like people found out proof that she had a boyfriend um uh -huh. and the way that they dealt with the situation was that she came out with a public apology video of her literally sobbing and she shaved her head in um in shame and guilt for lying about not having a boyfriend or for having a boyfriend and of course like things like humility and shame they're huge things in Japanese culture and like shaving a head in uh, for apology is not unheard of in Japanese culture but like I don't know personally I think the context of this like sh this shouldn't have been as serious like it's a girl group with 48 members like <laughs> If it was a solo artist, I don't agree with how this situation was handled, first of all. But if it was a solo artist, I would be a little more understanding in, like, the slightest way, because it's one girl. But in a girl oh, group of you, you 48... Mean... <laughs> I see what you're trying to say. Like, like, just take another one? Yeah, like, are you, like, surely, like, the whole thing about a girl group of that size is that they're one cohesive group you're not like singling out certain people um I mean I also don't know that much about J-pop in general um let alone this group so maybe I don't know she could have been like the most popular member or something like that but again I don't know that's 
it's really upsetting like the fact that she had to do that just for you know being in a relationship with somebody like it's sad very sad Mm -hmm. it's not fair no not at all like it's, it's already so difficult as an idol to have a private life and to even like build other relationships like it, it I, I can't imagine what it was like but I want to talk a little bit about Johnny and Associates because this is essentially why I thought of doing this episode um mm-hmm. so bring it down the rabbit hole Rihanna I will strap in because this is gonna be a lot of me talking okay <laughs> so Radio essay, let's go <laughs> basically um I go, like started learning about Johnny and Associates because there was this idol that I saw just like online somewhere and I was like wow he's really attractive um I want to learn more about him whatever he's funny whatever um I found out he's part of a group called Hey Say Jump and this is under an entertainment company called Johnny and Associates I look up Johnny and Associates And I find out, like, this is insane. Because, again, I'm not into J-pop. I don't know how it works. Um, So learning about this is just crazy. So Johnny and Associates, if you haven't guessed, was founded by a man named Johnny. Like, that's his name. Um, And this man was pretty much, like, the pioneer of the idol system where trainees are admitted into the agency at a young age to train in singing, dancing, acting, and everything until their debut. And he started this in the 80s, I believe. K-pop training systems, like, that didn't really happen until the 90s. So I'm pretty sure, like, that is factual to say that Johnny Kitagawa was the pioneer of this whole system as a whole but he is also the pioneer for like scouting idols just based off of like handsome guys and focusing on like their appeal as a person rather than focusing on their like dancing singing and acting so this guy's whole thing is that he gets idols he gets attractive guys he only works with men um he works with like he scouts like young kids like teenagers preteens um and trains them to be you know like relatively good at singing dancing and acting um but when they debut their whole appeal is just them like objectified he just wants to sell just he just wants to sell them as people essentially to the masses which and he like this isn't something that he's ashamed of or well Johnny is dead but (laughs) this isn't something he's he was ashamed of he was very vocal in that like he is pushing idols for the sake of just objectifying them not actually like focusing on singing dancing that's all like side things to help make more money and make more appeal but in general he's like trying to push out these idols as objects and because I've learned about this and didn't grow up with this like that's insane to me and on top of that um so kind of like I kind of touched upon this earlier about like when we're talking about V Live and everything but he control like completely controls every single aspect of publicity of for his idols so idols aren't it, it changed now they're more like Johnny Kitagawa passed away I think either 2020 2021 something like that uh due to old age like this man was old um (laughs) but when he was alive uh he had complete control of everything so idols weren't allowed to have any social media platform they could only have a social media platform it if it was through something called Johnny's web which is essentially Johnny's personal social media platform and 
a thing, a part of me, um, when I was younger, I tried to get into J-pop, but I just found it like really unaccessible. And I realize now that that's the case because, because of like mechanisms like this. So Johnny's Web, like it's completely in, J- in Japanese, has to be like, it's like a specific browser, or whatever, like, and it's only through that. So as a Western fan, you're, unless you're super deep into it, like you, there's just no way you're going to find anything about these idols, right? Um, and he did this thing also where he wouldn't even like post pictures of them. Um, he would just like post silhouettes of his idol. So there's that whole like mystery aspect to things where fans would be drawn to want to, they they would want to see their idols in person because they couldn't they couldn't see them online at all um and again Johnny had complete control over everything so these idols weren't actually like posting or anything it was completely through Johnny and like his workers or whatever um it's very black mirror to me and it's insane also because like this started in the 80s like this has been in the works for a while and still is uh and (laughs) to really add the cherry on top of everything uh johnny and associates obviously has been through many controversies so one big one was that he was suspected of having connections with mass media to produce extensive and favorable coverage on his company um the things that the company does and on himself as well so johnny he never ever showed his face to the media uh and part of this was suspected to be because like you know like not bribery but because he had connections he just he was never viewed in public ever um and an example i know um this is from the wikipedia by the way an example noted by journalists mentioned that johnny would threaten to withdraw his talents from certain music programs and channels if they provide unfavorable coverage or invite competing boy bands from other agencies and this he had so much power that he essentially controlled like the monopoly of like the media and the entertainment business in japan this man is huge he is the pioneer of this type of industry like mass producing everything and controlling everything and capitalizing off of everything he is the reason why any of this exists um Uh and on top of all that he's also been through a lot of like sexual abuse allegations specifically with minor minors the the trainees he would bring in um those i it's upsetting to see those the the information on those cases because typically it just happens where he'll either get charged or he'll like pay it off or like it just gets dropped immediately Mm -hmm. um and again like that's simply because this man is so incredibly powerful or was so incredibly powerful um and quite frankly i find it really disgusting um yeah for sure obviously yeah and so in the context of like how i found out about this um the idol that i like was searching into had been part of Johnny and Associates. I think he started when he was maybe like, I want to say 13, um, maybe maybe like 15 or something. I just remember him being very, very young. And he's been part of this company and is still part of this company. And he's almost 30. And they're still out here selling out concerts and stuff. Um, and that's insane to me because K-pop groups don't really have that lasting effect. Like they're usually overrun by more groups. Um, mm-hmm. 
as they get older and typically like companies will stop to stop caring about those groups as they get older as well just you know makes sense um but like Heisei Jump so the comp the group that I've been I've been looking at like they're out here still like doing things and I think recently they just opened up an Instagram account um they're already out of a lot of followers and and I'm pretty sure like again they just recently opened the Instagram because uh, like the the rules around social media have become more lenient after uh Johnny's passing so it's just so insane to me terrifying yeah for sure I mean even just the silhouette thing gave me the chill yeah like and I feel like that having that level of control over an idol and the way that they were being presented to the public creates an even bigger possibility for an obsessive fan because it's like I have to go through specifically Johnny's web to contact them and like I'm doing all of these things dedicating all of this time just to see you like it's just so ugh, it's so icky to me and I again I still don't know how like the j-pop industry works but knowing about this is just the tip of the iceberg and I still don't even understand it completely and I'm already like ugh, god scary very very scary yeah. Do you have any thoughts on what I've just shared? <laughs> I mean, it's it's certainly very disturbing. I mean, it's it's really interesting because as shocking as it is, like this is, in my opinion, probably just a case of. A company that's been exposed mm -hmm. because in in my mind I think this is probably the norm and I oh mean, yeah for sure for we, sure we see this a lot with I guess expose documentaries on even just like a business even just businesses mm -hmm. and and so this doesn't I mean I'm not saying that it's not shocking but it's uh -huh. not it's not too far off oh yeah reality yeah right? yeah and I, I hate that i i'm saying that because it it's not normal but mm, it's not at all but it doesn't feel that foreign no it really doesn't and again this is just like <sighs> the start of it which is why I think also why um there's so much information on this uh company in general because you know he is like the founder of all this but mm -hmm. and he was also very vocal about it but you can't like you can imagine what newer companies are like who may like take it more extreme Ugh, mm -hmm. it, it's so Ugh. it's icky yeah it, it certainly gives you the chill yeah and because this is just someone that got caught yeah for real with all of this information that we've just laid out what we really want people to take from this is that there is so much toxicity in the Asian entertainment business and some people listening may be like either avid fans or you know just consume as it passes by your feed or as you hear it on the news but please take this into mind when you consume this type of media um we said this earlier but 
even though idols don't know who you are and they'll never know who you are, they are still people. And it's so easy to look at news headlines and be like, and judge people or just have certain opinions, but understand the underlying mechanism to all this because it's very disturbing if you think about it. Uh, and be very be mindful. Yeah. Just even just understanding how it works or how surface level it works, it'll help you consume your media in a more healthy way, I think. Mm-hmm. Be careful. I mean, like the age old thing, like don't believe everything you hear or see. Mm-hmm. And it, it is difficult because every day we find out that something is a lie. Mm-hmm. But it's a, what's the word? It's, it's, an, it's, it's an effort you make, a trying effort you make every day. Mm-hmm. No one's perfect, but it doesn't hurt to try. And you know what? We'll, we'll end, we'll end on that note, that mm-hmm. cautionary, <laughs> not sure if that's the word, but I, th- I think this is a good, a good place to end on. So with that, thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. We hope you had a good time. Thank you for, thank you for watching. <laughs> if you were watching. <laughs> yes. And as always, feel free to leave a comment down below. Mm-hmm. Letting us know your thoughts, anything you might have learned from this episode, any feelings you have. Mm-hmm. Do you know people that kind of have a parasocial relationship? Do you once have a parasocial relationship? Do you currently have a parasocial relationship? Mm-hmm. It's okay. It's, it is okay. I'm, it's normal in the sense that it happens a lot. Yeah, and like sometimes people just need that to cope. I get it. Yeah, and I mean, I guess depending on the degree, it's not always necessarily a bad thing. Yeah. To have a level of an emotion of our kind of like, you know those celebrities that people have known since their childhood? Like, they're, they're like, that celebrity is everyone's childhood. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, for sure. I think that is a little different. Yeah, of course. streaming platforms such as spotify anchor apple podcasts and more follow us for more behind the scenes content announcements and other random things we decide to put on there 